Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is November 30, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 40. On November 24, 1978, the day after Thanksgiving, the Washington Post here in Washington, D.C., published a full-page memorial to late Congressman Leo J. Ryan of California. A sketch of Ryan in tones of gray took up the entire page, and against that background a brief eulogy was printed in bold type. It began, quote, In memoriam to our good friend Leo J. Ryan, Congressman from California, we will miss him. He saw hope that right would prevail." Unquote. The timing of this memorial page was ironic. Congressman Ryan had been killed in Guyana nearly one week earlier, and his funeral had taken place two days earlier, but Congressman Ryan had been deliberately sacrificed in order to launch a covert military operation in Guyana. And as it turned out, the Washington Post memorial to Ryan was printed immediately after the successful completion of this military operation. In a display of courage that is practically unknown today in the United States Congress, Ryan had gone to Guyana knowing that it might be dangerous. But what he did not know was that he had been lured into making a trip whose tragic outcome was planned well ahead of time. Congressman Ryan and those who died with him at Port Kaituma Airport were casualties in the secret war that is leading to Nuclear War One, And so were the hundreds of other American civilians who died in the so-called mass suicide at Jonestown, Guyana. For more than two years now the United States and Russia have been embroiled in secret hostilities in preparation for Nuclear War One. It began in earnest during the summer of 1976 when the still-secret underwater missile crisis erupted. Then it expanded into wholesale nuclear sabotage of the United States, with weapons now planted at literally thousands of locations nationwide. These ranged from mammoth hydrogen bombs ready to destroy our largest dams and reservoirs down to tiny nuclear devices called micro-nukes by the Russians. For some time now the Russians have been detonating micro-nukes in a steady drumbeat of explosions all over America. In September 1977 the secret war took a decisive new turn. In the still secret battle of the Harvest Moon in space, America's secret rulers lost their supposed ace in the hole for the coming war. In a shocking upset, Russia knocked out America's secret moonbeam weapons base in Copernicus Crater. And since that time, Russia has seized a dominant position militarily in space. In past AUDIO LETTERS I have kept my listeners abreast of these developments, and for the past year I have also been calling attention to the drastic changes taking place in the leadership of both Russia and the United States. In Russia, the original ruling faction after 1917, the atheistic Bolsheviks, have been overthrown after a progressive struggle for six decades. The Kremlin is now under the absolute control of a tough band of native Russians, a Christian sect who consider the Bolsheviks to be evil incarnate. As a result, the Bolsheviks are being expelled from Russia, and they are flocking mostly to the United States. They are joining the many Bolsheviks already in powerful positions here in a sophisticated new Bolshevik revolution. In the process they are gradually preempting much of the power that was once exercised by their secret allies, the third generation Rockefeller Brothers. As Bolshevik power becomes greater and greater in the United States, the satanic fruits of that power are becoming increasingly visible. Seven months ago in April 1978 the lives of over 100 unsuspecting civilians were deliberately put in great danger for the sake of an intelligence mission. This was the case of Korean Airlines Flight 902, which invaded super-sensitive Russian airspace and was shot down. As I explained in detail that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 33, there was nothing accidental about the Korean Airliner episode and the threat of death to all the innocent passengers was a key ingredient in the episode. 
it would have been far easier for the Russian fighters to blow the Boeing 707 out of the air and of all flame than to force it down with only a few casualties, as was done. Today the Bolshevik grip on America is even greater than it was last April, and human life is growing cheaper by the day. This time it was not a hundred but nearly a thousand civilian lives, and this time they did die because nothing was left to chance. The gruesome tragedy at Jonestown, Guyana is only a pale shadow of what lies ahead for the entire United States if the cancer of Bolshevism is not stopped. Those who are seized by the Bolshevik way of thinking are schizophrenic and satanic and unable to tell right from wrong. When these tendencies are allowed to go unchecked and the Bolsheviks acquire power, the consequences for society as a whole are tragic. Both murderous and suicidal actions take place on a scale beyond comprehension. It happened 60 years ago in Russia as the Bolsheviks took over there, and now as the Bolsheviks are taking over, it is beginning to happen here too in the United States of America. My three topics for this month are Topic No. 1, the military purpose of the Jonestown tragedy, Topic No. 2, the Battle of Guyana, Thanksgiving Day, 1978, and Topic No. 3, the opening scenes of Nuclear War I. Topic No. 1. It is now nearly two weeks since the November 18 slaughter of Congressman Ryan and four other Americans at the Port Kaituma Airport, Guyana. During most of that time the State Department has been under heavy fire from the friends and staff of the late Congressman, and with good reason. Over a period of a year and more the State Department received bushels of mail from American citizens concerned about friends and relatives at Jonestown. Congressman Ryan, too, kept urging an investigation, but the State Department never did carry out an investigation worthy of the name. It was only after Congressman Ryan received what amounted to a whitewash report on Jonestown that he made his ill-fated decision to go see for himself. Congressman Ryan, my friends, was the victim of deliberate entrapment for reasons which I will explain shortly. Careful analysis of his psychological profile had revealed that he could be provoked into going to Jonestown by denying him hard information through normal channels. Intelligence operatives within the State Department made sure that any reports to Ryan about Jonestown would not meet with his satisfaction. Right now State Department spokesmen are trying to act dumb about their role in the grisly events of recent days. They wave their hands and try to look foolish as they explain why they somehow failed to spot the dangers at Jonestown. But the Jonestown disaster was actually spawned by a military situation in Guyana which I first made public over four years ago, and then as now the only response of the government was cover-up. As my older listeners all know, I'm referring to the Russian nuclear missile base in Guyana. Beginning in June 1974, I revealed the presence of the Guyana Missile Base on radio programs all across America, and in October 1974 I repeated this warning in my very first talking tape, Audio Book No. 1 entitled, How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War. The following words are a direct quote from that first tape of more than four years ago. According to my very reliable intelligence sources on this matter, the Republic of Guyana next to Venezuela and South America, has already been turned into another Cuba with atomic missiles aimed at the Gatun locks of the Panama Canal and at our cities here in the United States. Of course our government, which dances to the tune called by the dynasty, refuses even to investigate seriously my charges on this score." End of quotation from Audio Book 1. Since then I have repeated my warnings about these Russian missiles in Guyana in my AUDIO letters, as you well know. But when I first made these charges on radio, many of you sent letters and telegrams to the State Department, mostly by way of your Congressman and the Pentagon. You demanded to know if my charges were true, and for your effort you got gobbledygook and denials. And many of you sent me these letters, 
saying that you did not believe the government. Well, my friends, you were right. The developments which were destined to culminate in tragedy at Jonestown began some 13 years ago in 1965. Guyana was a newly independent country, the former British colony of British Guyana. At that time the secret Rockefeller Soviet Alliance was in full swing, and the long-range joint plans for a controlled nuclear war were moving right along. Both sides were looking ahead toward an eventual double-cross but that still lay far in the future at that time. As I've explained in past AUDIO letters, the deliberate strengthening of Russia at America's expense was part of their joint plan for world government and conquest. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 threw a temporary monkey wrench into the program when President John F. Kennedy intervened personally and stopped the nuclear arming of Cuba, and for doing that he lost his life in Dallas barely a year later. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, made sure that he followed the script more carefully. In the wake of the Cuban crisis, the Russia needed a new forward base in the Caribbean area for strategic purposes until the heat was off in Cuba. To accommodate Russia, Guyana was selected for this purpose, and David Rockefeller saw to it that a Marxist named Forbes Burnham became Prime Minister. In return, the Chase Manhattan Bank became fiscal agent for Guyana, giving Rockefeller access to the gold produced in Guyana. And as a key factor in all of this, then President Lyndon Johnson in 1965 turned over the formerly American Air Base Atkinson Field to Guyana. America's right to retain control of the base for several more decades was simply thrown away without excuse. Atkinson Field, which was renamed Tamara Airfield, is south of Georgetown, the capital city. This is the airfield to which American helicopters carried bodies to be airlifted to America after the Jonestown disaster this month. When Johnson gave the Tamara Airfield to Marcus Guyana, he handed Russia a very large plum indeed. The Tamara Airfield is the largest in all of Latin America, larger even than New York's largest airport, the John F. Kennedy Airport and its location makes it ideal for ferrying Cuban troops and supplies to Africa. As a result, Johnson's action on behalf of the Rockefellers robbed the United States of an important logistic connection to Africa while opening the door for Cuban troops. Our troubles years later with uh, Cuban troops in Angola and elsewhere in Africa are partly the result. For a number of years Russian military activity in Guyana was heavily concentrated around the vicinity of the Tamara Airfield. In fact, when I first reported the Russian missiles in Guyana in 1974, they were in place in sites that ringed the airfield. Within the past two years, however, the missiles were pulled out from these locations and moved to a separate missile complex west of Georgetown. In this new complex, the missiles were deployed at sites scattered over an area some 30 miles across. In the approximate center was a command and control installation commanded by Russian personnel. After this missile base relocation was completed, the missile complex was centered at a point about 70 miles northwest of Tamara Airfield, and roughly another 70 miles to the northwest lay the People's Temple Commune at Jonestown, an Israeli-type kibbutz. So the missile base ended up about midway between the Jonestown Commune and Tamara Airfield. It was no accident, my friends, that the People's Temple Kibbutz was located so close to the missile base. But the origins of the People's Temple in the 1950s had nothing to do with government intrigues. It was not until about 1970 that certain elements of the United States intelligence community began to infiltrate and subvert the People's Temple. As I've explained in the past, it's always been standard practice by the Rockefeller Brothers to support not only the faction in power but also spies and opponents to that faction. In this way they are always in a position, at least in theory, to cut down anyone who tries to break free of their control. In the case of Guyana, the Rockefellers wanted to have such a tool in Guyana as a check on Forbes Burnham, the Prime Minister whom they had put in power with their money. Certain elements within the United States Intelligence Community under general coordination by the CIA were given the task of finding ways of accomplishing this. In the course of evaluating various options, it was concluded that the People's Temple would prove ideal. 
The psychological profile of the leader, Jim Jones, indicated that he could be converted into a powerful tool of our unseen rulers. Contrary to reports in the controlled major media, Jim Jones was born a Jew, and he already exhibited tendencies toward kibbutz-style organization that could be channeled into useful directions. This will be brought about through a combination of both conscious and unconscious factors. At the conscious level, money and powerful political support will be channeled in his direction. At the unconscious level, the technique of psychological programming, which I described in some of my early AUDIO letters, would be employed. Gradually, Jim Jones would lose control of his own personality and become what our unseen rulers wanted him to be. The process would inevitably create tremendous internal conflicts and turn Jim Jones into a troubled and dangerous man. And that, my friends, was what was done. By 1973 changes in Jones' behavior began to be noticed by his friends and followers. His conversion into a semi-conscious agent of death and intrigue was underway in earnest. That same year the mushrooming funds of the People's Temple were used to launch the agricultural kibbutz at Jonestown, Guyana, though only a few people went there at that time. Guyana is a rigid Marxist police state, and no one could have launched a new enterprise like the Commune without its approval by Forbes Burnham. But David Rockefeller agents made sure that Burnham received all the assurances he needed that the Jones compound would fit neatly into the Marxist environment of Guyana, and at the same time Forbes Burnham had begun double-crossing David Rockefeller exactly as feared. He was playing ball politically, but he was hiding much of Guyana's gold production in caves in the mountains. David Rockefeller found this out some time later, but by then the much bigger problem was developing of the double cross by Russia. So Burnham was left untouched in order to make way for bigger things. When I began warning radio listeners all across America about the Guyana missiles during the summer of 1974, the Rockefeller brothers were still in bed with the Kremlin. There were already ominous signs that something was happening in Russia which they did not understand, but they simply could not imagine that their old Kremlin allies, the Bolsheviks, were being overthrown. And so my public warnings about Guyana missiles were denied and ridiculed by government spokesmen who were lying. A carefully programmed nuclear war was being planned for the late 1970s, and they did not want the plan to be spoiled by public awareness. But two years later Russia's all-out military double-cross of America began with the underwater missile crisis of 1976. Most of you know about that crisis which the government kept silent about, but which I detailed in AUDIO LETTERS 14 through 16. Our unseen rulers were badly shaken by that surprise and initially tried to reinstate their secret alliance with the Kremlin rulers. After all, they had succeeded in doing so once before after President Kennedy broke the rules and made an issue of the Cuban missiles, but meanwhile they also began setting in motion contingency plans to gear up for a possible real war. The Guyana Missile Base was one of the major targets of this revised planning. When this planning began more than two years ago, the Space Battle of the Harvest Moon still lay a year in the future. It seemed inconceivable that America could lose its secret beam weapons base, which was soon to be operational on the moon. And so long as they had this moon base to depend on, our unseen rulers thought they could not lose. But in light of the underwater missile double-cross, they wanted to be able to pull as many of Russia's military teeth as possible. In this way their destruction of Russia would be even more complete than originally planned. The planners of Operation Guyana were given a difficult problem to solve. The objective was to wipe out the Russian missile base in Guyana, thereby removing the threat it posed to the Panama Canal and southern American cities. But this was to be a pre-war operation carried out covertly and with complete surprise. It had to be covert because neither the United States nor Russia could afford to have it known that the base ever existed, and the surprise had to be complete because with even the briefest warning the base could be reinforced and defended by Cuban troops. From these requirements it was concluded that a commando-style raid would be necessary something like the Israeli raid at Entebbe Airport in Uganda in July 1976. 
Any other kind of attack would have required that our leaders do what President Kennedy did in 1962, and that is tell the American people what was afoot, and ask for our support. And at all costs the one thing our unseen rulers were determined not to do was to tell you and me anything. The problem then arose how to get the joint attacking forces into Guyana in a force large enough and fast enough to do the job. Wiping out a major missile base like that in Guyana, after all, is no small task, and it takes experience. It was concluded that somehow some very sudden, massive, compelling excuse would have to be provided in order to enable the secret joint military forces to enter Guyana temporarily. The excuse, whatever it was, would have to be so visible as to tie Russia's hands so that Russia could not retaliate in Guyana without giving away what she had been up to there, and the excuse, whatever it was, would have to appear non-military, yet require military expertise. Furthermore, some provision would have to be made for all casualties in the missile base attack to be removed from Guyana after the raid. Otherwise their presence in Guyana could have been made the basis of an international incident trumped up around some different story unrelated to the secret missile base. For example, the Government of Guyana, following Russian dictates, might have publicly displayed the bodies of the joint military forces killed in the attack, and said they were killed in an attempted coup d'état against Forbes Burnham. It was a very big order, but the Jonestown kibbutz proved to be the answer. All that was necessary was to arrange for many hundreds of American citizens to die suddenly in Guyana, and under conditions guaranteeing instant massive publicity. The sheer enormity of the tragedy would require military involvement, and the location of Jonestown was made to order. Helicopters commuting between the Tamara Airfield and Jonestown would naturally fly over the missile complex, whose details were known in spite of expert camouflage. This meant that Joint Special Armed Forces could be set down near the perimeters of the missile base and later recovered along with casualties with relative ease. And as the reporters at the Tamara Airfield watched helicopters leaving to the northwest and return from the same direction, they were led to assume that all were going to and from Jonestown, 150 miles away. They had no way of knowing that many of the flights were to and from the Russian missile base, which lay in the same direction but only half as far away. When it was decided to use mass deaths at Jonestown as a cover for the missile base attack, Jonestown was functioning only as an outpost of the People's Temple. There were not enough people there to provide a sufficiently major incident to serve the intended purpose, and so through both direct and indirect means Jim Jones was persuaded to go to the Guyana kibbutz himself, taking as many of his flock as would follow him. That turned out to be about 25 to 30 percent and by following him they automatically identified themselves as the group most highly dependent upon Jones personally. They were also most susceptible to the combined influences of exhaustion, intimidation, and isolation from outside help, in other words, ripe for brainwashing. And ever since the days of the Korean War it's been known conclusively that brainwashing techniques can force many people to do all kinds of things. Even hardened American GIs in Korea fell victim to brainwashing in surprising numbers because they did not understand what they were up against. And of course the Jonestown victims were anything but hardened soldiers. In August 1977 Jim Jones left for Guyana with his large sacrificial flock. That same month United Nations Ambassador Andrew Young carried a message to Prime Minister Forbes Burnham of Guyana. He said that under certain conditions the United States and the World Bank would increase its aid to Guyana, that is, line Burnham's pocket, by a factor of ten times more than previous levels. And so the key disaster at Jonestown was set in motion in the days shortly before the Battle of the Harvest Moon last year. To trigger the whole tragedy in a glare of publicity, the interest of late Congressman Leo J. Ryan was developed and programmed. And as the time approached for Congressman Ryan to make his anticipated trip to Guyana, other activities were set in motion on the diplomatic and military stage. It was essential that Russia's attention be diverted away from Guyana until too late to take action to protect the missile base. 
Russia's prize in the Western Hemisphere, of course, is Cuba. And so, in the final days before the Battle of Guyana on Thanksgiving Day, 1978, the trumped-up MiG-23 crisis remember that? was used to divert Russian attention to Cuba. Only too late did the Kremlin discover that the real target was not Cuba but Guyana. Topic No. 2. Close aides of the late Congressman Leo Ryan have reported publicly that his ill-fated decision to go to Guyana was triggered by a State Department report to him that he found unsatisfactory. As I have mentioned already, this reaction of Ryan's had been predicted and in fact deliberately encouraged. With elections coming up, Congressman Ryan decided to schedule the trip after the election during the Congressional recess. This was a natural decision and had also been anticipated by the planners behind the scenes. And as the time approached for his trip, the false issue of the Cuban MiG-23 crisis erupted. The Carter Administration had learned nearly one year ago that the Russians were going to send the MiG-23s to Cuba and decided that it would be the perfect pretext for a fake crisis. The MiG-23, my friends, can carry certain types of nuclear weapons as claimed. But even in this role it is a tactical weapon best suited for support of ground or naval forces. The MiG-23 in and of itself does not threaten America in the same way that the 1962 Cuban missiles did, and so when the United States began playing up the MiG-23s it was very obvious to the Kremlin that this was a deliberate effort to stir up public tension over Cuba. The question was, exactly what was the United States up to? Would the Carter Administration be so crazy as to invade Cuba? Such a thing sounded irrational, but America's unseen rulers are behaving more and more irrationally. Partly this is deliberate and is intended to keep the chess players in the Kremlin off balance, but it is also partly a result of the increasing degree of control over America by those satanic schizophrenics, the Bolsheviks. Cuba is after all very important to Russia for Russia is looking ahead to world domination after Nuclear War I, and for that Cuba is Russia's main beachhead in the Western Hemisphere. Even more urgently, Cuba is the unadmitted home of Russia's Caribbean submarine fleet. This fleet has repeatedly moved into attack positions in the Gulf of Mexico over the past two years and more during periods of tension. And as if that were not enough, there are concentrations of nuclear weapons in at least four land locations in Cuba. One is near the north coast, roughly 10 miles inland, southeast of Cardenas. This location is 150 miles due south of Cape Sable, Florida. A second site is about 150 miles to the east-southeast of that and about 10 miles inland from the north coast. 125 miles farther to the southeast is a third concentration 15 miles northeast of Marti, well inland, and the fourth nuclear site is near the eastern tip of Cuba, 28 miles north-northwest of the United States Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay. With all this at stake, American publicity over the MiG-23s caused worry in the Kremlin, and in early November the tension increased when the United States began sending SR-71 reconnaissance flights over Cuba shades of 1962. In response, massive formations from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Caribbean submarine fleets of the Russian Navy began fanning out along America's east, west, and Gulf coasts on November 6. They did not deploy into attack formations, but their sheer numbers signaled a clear warning to Washington. At this very moment they are still on station, many with neutron weaponry. Then during the week immediately preceding the tragedies in Guyana, the MiG-23 pseudo-crisis built to a climax. Beginning on Tuesday, November 14, a huge combined American and British Naval Task Force began heading toward Cuba. By midweek Cuban Defense Forces were on full alert, and on Thursday, November 16, a group of 12 United States Senators in Moscow supposedly to discuss the SALT talks met with Russia's Kosygin. There they pressed the alleged issue of the Cuban MiG-23s, and Kosygin flew into a rage. 
He shouted, I thought you were here to discuss peace. According to James Reston's New York Times article of November 26, 1978, one Senator, John Glenn of Ohio, reportedly tried to defuse the MiG-23 argument, calling it a false issue. Quote, unquote. As a former test pilot and America's first astronaut in orbit, Senator Glenn knew what he was talking about, but Kosygin's anger over the other comments about the MiGs provided the United States intelligence community with valuable proof that the decoy action toward Cuba was working. The next day, November 17, Russia publicly admitted sending MiG-23s to Cuba, calling them strictly defensive weapons. The same day, an editorial in the Washington Post typified the crescendo of media attention to the Cuban MiG-23s. It was titled, A New Cuban Missile Crisis? The very next day, Saturday, November 18, Congressman Leo Ryan, three newsmen and a woman, seeking to escape from Jonestown, were slaughtered at the Port Kaituma Airport. At least a dozen other people were also wounded, but there was no effort to destroy the airplane filled with terrified escapees from Jonestown. Instead, many witnesses were left alive, and a smaller plane managed to take off right after the airport massacre and report the attack in the capital, Georgetown. Immediately world attention was focused on Guyana, and meanwhile the mass murder at Jonestown, wrongly called a mass suicide, was underway. At this point the elaborate decoy action toward Cuba was no longer needed, so the Pentagon announced that a routine naval exercise was in progress, which would approach no closer to Cuba than 50 miles. Cuban Defense Forces relaxed, but the real action was only beginning in Guyana. The methodical executions of Congressman Ryan and three prominent newsmen had guaranteed that Jonestown would shortly be in the glare of publicity. Having guaranteed this publicity, Jim Jones then ordered the mass executions at the Jonestown kibbutz. The complete details of the Jonestown disaster may never be known publicly. I can tell you, though, that of those who died there, very few willingly and deliberately took their own lives, and that is what suicide is. Many were tricked, not realizing that the death rites were real. Many more resisted, but they were weak, helpless, and confronted with armed execution squads. So by various means several hundred people were poisoned with potassium cyanide. However, there were many others who did try to escape and who resisted more effectively. Many of these people were herded off into the jungle and shot without mercy. Finally, when the mass murder was completed, the executioners performed their final task of stage managing the horrible death scene. In order to achieve the surprise needed in attacking the Russian missile base, it was critically important that the first reports from Jonestown describe the scene as a mass suicide. Only in this way could its actual military significance be hidden long enough to fool the Russians. So all the bodies that were free of gunshot wounds were carefully arranged in neat rows and other groupings, suggesting at first sight that everyone died willingly and deliberately. This was the scene that greeted Guyanese troops late the following day, Sunday, November 19. It was more than 24 hours after the kibbutz victims died, and the executioners, including the real Jim Jones, were long gone. I will return to the matter of Jones himself later. The Guyanese troops were afraid of possible disease, but counted the bodies as accurately as possible. The total they reported was 409 Sunday night. The initial impression of a mass suicide was seized upon by the controlled major media of the United States. Without waiting for an investigation, the media drummed away at the suicide image of Jonestown as if it were a proven fact. After a few days a few people did begin to raise questions, but by then the initial image of suicide had served its purpose of opening Guyana's doors to the United States. For example, on Tuesday, November 21, Jim Jones' surviving son Stephen said in a Georgetown press conference, quote, There's no way it could have been mass suicide, unquote. And the same day, according to the Washington Star, 
A Guyanese source pointed out a serious medical discrepancy in the Jonestown kibbutz death scene. He said, quote, If you die of cyanide, which seems to have been the poison, your body goes into spasm and contorts in death, but at Jonestown everyone looked relaxed." Unquote. The reason for this discrepancy, my friends, was that by the time the Guyanese troops arrived all the bodies had been rearranged, as I have stated. They were also placed face down for the most part. This was so that the widely publicized news photos would not ruin the desired impression of calm by letting us see the victims' final expressions of agony. To continue the nightmare charade to fool the Russians, the United States at first publicly urged Guyana to collect and bury the hundreds of bodies. As arranged, Guyana replied in effect that it was America's problem and that America should take the bodies back to the United States. To facilitate this huge and hideous task, Guyana obligingly agreed to waive the usual Guyanese law that requires anybody to be autopsied before removal from the country. With this arrangement the United States achieved the carte blanche military access to Guyana that was needed. Russian intelligence realized what was afoot by early Monday, November 20, but it was already too late to stop it. Russia could hardly announce to the world, we have a secret nuclear missile base in Guyana and the United States is getting ready to destroy it. That would have rallied world opinion behind America, and although Russian Cosmospheres quickly converged over Guyana, they too were useless in the covert conditions of battle there. Their charged Particle Beam weapons could have made short work of the Commando-style forces, but in the process they would have wiped out the Russian base itself. The Guyana missiles had become only a minor factor in Russia's military power since the Battle of the Harvest Moon last year. They were not valuable enough to Russia to declare open war on their account, and so under these conditions Russia was powerless to act once the Jonestown tragedy had been staged. As Thanksgiving Day approached, huge American transports, helicopters, troops, and medical teams swarmed into Guyana. In a remote corner of the huge Tamara airfield, a command post was established for the twin operations at Jonestown and at the Russian missile base. As some of the troops began the nauseating task of cleaning up the Jonestown kibbutz, other Joint Attack Forces were taking up positions around the missile base in preparations for the surprise raid. Meanwhile, day after day, the death count reported at Jonestown remained unchanged at 409. Then on Thanksgiving Day itself the Battle of Guyana took place. Crack military forces, experienced in jungle and surprise warfare, moved in on the Russian complex, striking all the dispersed sites simultaneously. Like the Entebbe Raid, the battle itself did not last long. It had to be over quickly to be successful. First the small crews on site near each missile were overwhelmed and then killed. The missiles themselves were quickly disabled. Next the military forces converged on the Missile Command and Control Center where a bloody pitched battle took place. When the smoke cleared, every single person manning the missile base had been killed, including the Russian commanders. When the battle was over, American helicopters from Tamara Airfield began landing within the ruined missile complex and flying out the wounded. Then the remaining attackers were left with two more jobs before they could retire from the area. First they were under strict orders to leave no bodies of the attacking forces on Guyanese soil, and so the entire area was scoured until every single member of the attacking force had been accounted for. Their bodies, like those of the victims at Jonestown, were sealed in Vietnam-type body bags and collected in clearings where helicopters could land to pick them up. Finally, the combined forces were under orders to remove the nuclear warheads from the missiles and take them back to Georgetown for airlift to the United States. Specially trained members of the attacking force had set to work on this task immediately after the initial attacks on the missile crews. By early Friday, November 24, all the warheads had been removed. They too were placed in body bags, one per bag, with some jungle foliage stuffed in to give the bag a reasonable appearance. Of course, none of this was apparent to the reporters at the Mara Airfield, whose access to the American command post there was carefully controlled. 
When wounded members of the Joint Forces were flown back to the airfield after the Battle of Guyana on Thanksgiving afternoon, they were kept out of sight of the reporters. Otherwise, when reporters occasionally saw body bags being moved from place to place, they naturally assumed that all contained victims from Jonestown. They had no way of knowing that some contained slain commandos and that others contained Russian nuclear warheads. The continual cargo of death from the Jonestown kibbutz made the perfect cover for the aftermath of the Battle of Guyana. Some reporters have been puzzled at the choice of Dover Air Force Base in Delaware for the Guyana airlift. Most of the Jonestown victims were from California, and there is a mortuary facility similar to the Dover facility at Oakland Air Force Base in California. Dover was chosen, my friends, to facilitate transfer of the Russian nuclear warheads to the nearby Aberdeen Proving Ground and Arsenal. This was done by means of shuttle flights from Dover to Phillips Air Force Base. Originally the Guyanese count of 409 had been accepted as firm by United States officials in Guyana. That had raised questions as to where the rest of the 1,000 or so residents reported to be in Jonestown had gone. Finally on Thanksgiving Day, with the body cleanup operation well underway, a military spokesman told reporters, quote, The evaluation that we have made is simply that there were not many more people in Jonestown at the time of the suicide." Unquote. But even as he spoke, the Battle of Guyana was raging at the Russian missile base. By midday on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, 485 body bags had already arrived at the Tamara Airfield. The bodies and warheads from the Russian missile base were destined to raise the total far beyond the total of 409 bodies originally counted by the Guyanese at the kibbutz. It was a bad mistake, the kind of thing that happens in the heat of battle. Something had to be done and fast. So on that Friday after Thanksgiving, a breathless and nervous Pentagon spokesman at the Tamara Airfield made a stunning announcement over CBS television, quote, The original count of persons found dead at the Jonestown site has been found to be seriously in error. It now appears there may be as many as 780 bodies total found at the site. They were found simply buried under other bodies. There were larger adults that were grouped together, and under their bodies were found the bodies of smaller adults and children." Unquote. Badgered by incredulous reporters, the government embellished the cover story later on. The Washington Star quoted the same spokesman as saying Friday night, quote, near the center of the pile of bodies near the assembly hall. They were three deep in some areas. They were in layers with blankets between them." Unquote. This story was so unbelievable that within two days the United States Government dismissed its own story about the blankets as a rumor. Quote, unquote. Still, the basic idea of bodies on top of bodies had to be maintained. So on Saturday, November 25, another Air Force spokesman tried to make it all sound plausible in the following words, quote, From what I observed, the people when they committed suicide would line up in nice and neat little circles, children in front of them, and as they died they folded into the interior of the circle." Unquote. The Guyana cover-up is worldwide in its dimensions. In Guyana, Deputy Prime Minister Reed made the first public announcement to the Guyanese people about Jonestown on Friday afternoon, November 24, in Parliament. Then he refused to answer questions and rushed out to cries of shame, shame, and cover-up from Parliament members. And here in the United States on Thanksgiving Day, FBI Director William Webster said that the Quote, FBI Disaster Squad has positively identified the body of James Warren Jones through fingerprint identification records." Unquote. But my friends, they fingerprinted a look-alike. Jones himself was at that very moment making good his escape from Guyana. All the preparations for Jones to make his escape have been made well in advance. An ocean-going boat well stocked with supplies of money was waiting for him near the river town of Bartica, 35 miles southwest of Georgetown. In order to make his way to Bartica from Jonestown, Jones had a safe conduct pass. In the early morning of Thanksgiving Day, as the Battle of Guyana was beginning, Jones headed downstream toward Georgetown. 
Shortly after noon Guiana time his boat left the mouth of the Essequibo River into the Atlantic Ocean. From there Jones followed a complicated itinerary which was designed to prevent his being followed, but in spite of that, my friends, he was followed. From Guyana Jones headed due east for about 330 miles and then turned south, landing near Amir, French Guiana, about 5.30 a.m. local time, November 27. From there he traveled by land to the capital, Cayenne, and took an airplane across the Atlantic Ocean to Freetown, Sierra Leone in West Africa. From Freetown he headed north along the coast to Guinea-Bissau Airport, arriving at approximately 7 p.m. local time, November 28. There, less than two hours later, he boarded a DC-3 and took off. His route took him eastward to Tambacounda, Senegal, from there onward into Mali with stops at Segu, Mopti, and Gao, then onward to Agadiz, Niger, and Largo, Chad. From there his plane continued to Atmara, Sudan, and then a short final hop to Port Sudan, where he arrived shortly after 4 o'clock this morning, November 30, local time. When he arrived at Port Sudan, Jones found a turboprop executive transport waiting for him, owned and operated by Israeli intelligence. Within 20 minutes the plane took off with Jones and headed up the middle of the Red Sea toward the Gulf of Aqaba. At 6.30 a.m. local time this morning, November 30, Jones's plane landed briefly at Elat, the back door to Israel, then onto a private airport outside of Jerusalem, arriving at 7.20 a.m. local time. From there he headed to a nearby location for an intelligence debriefing. After being transformed gradually into a conscious agent of the intelligence community over the past half dozen years, Jones has taken part in a joint operation by American and Israeli intelligence in Guyana. The Israelis had contributed valuable expertise and even key lieutenants for Jones in showing how the Jonestown kibbutz could be set up and used for the intended purposes. One has only to look at an encyclopedia to see that Jonestown was, in fact, a kibbutz. For example, the World Book Encyclopedia under the topic Israel says, quote, In a collective community called a kibbutz, the farmers share all the property and combine their labor. The village administration provides all their needs. The adults eat together in a dining hall, but married couples and single persons have private sleeping quarters. All children are raised together in a separate home. Parents visit their children for an hour or two before supper." Unquote. My friends, the word Communism, which has been domesticated here in America, means living in a commune. There is no purer form of commune than the Israeli kibbutz. When a commune is run by persons with satanic, schizophrenic characteristics like those of Jim Jones, Murderous and suicidal behavior are forced upon the people, as happened at Jonestown. And when this example is expanded to include an entire nation, one has a nation in the grip of Bolshevism. It is happening now to America, and we ourselves are being led and forced into national suicide against our will. Topic No. 3 Many Americans today tend to think of World War II as having started on December 7, 1941. That was the day when open warfare came to America at Pearl Harbor. But World War II really began over two years before Pearl Harbor, on September 1, 1939. On that day Hitler's troops marched into Poland, unleashing a tide of events that swept Germany and Japan crashing into ruins. So from that day onward it made no sense to talk about preventing World War II. The question became instead how to end the war. In the same way, my friends, it no longer makes any sense to speak of preventing Nuclear War I because it has already begun. It began secretly on Thanksgiving Day, November 23, 1978, with the Battle of Guyana. And while America's nationwide Pearl Harbor still lies in the future, all evidence indicates that this time we do not have two years to wait. As this secret war continues prior to open all-out war, we must now brace ourselves for Russian retaliation against the United States. By destroying their missile base in Guyana, America and Israel wiped out an overseas Russian military installation 
and killed Russian personnel, and they did so in a way that made any public protest by Russia impossible. In the past Russia has often retaliated in kind whenever injured, and may well do so again this time. If so, geophysical warfare could well be the ideal tool, destroying a military installation seemingly by natural disaster. In the Battle of the Harvest Moon 14 months ago, America lost, and the very rules of war were altered. Russia then tried to force America to surrender through SALT II disarmament, but our unseen rulers instead stepped up preparations for a suicidal nuclear war. Now in Guyana the opening scenes of nuclear war have already given a preview for the entire war. By the standards of those who planned it, the Battle of Guyana was a brilliant success, and yet at what cost? Many times more American lives were deliberately sacrificed than were lost by the enemy in the battle itself. In the same way, the American first strike strategy which I detailed three months ago will cause American deaths to dwarf those inflicted on Russia. The Battle of Guyana was an exercise in futility, a mere scratch on the arm for Russia. It was planned before the Battle of the Harvest Moon, which rendered this month's battle in Guyana obsolete before it happened. Perhaps the lessons for all of us were best summarized in the ironic sign that hung over Jim Jones' throne in the grisly silence at Jonestown, quote, Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Unquote. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.